a lot of people would say, well, look what happened in America. Uh, you know, they came in near the top of the death rate uh, sort of stats, uh, over uh, 300 uh, deaths per 100,000. Australia way down the list, much better performance on paper, death rate of less than 40 per 100,000. You would say, I think there's much more to the story, but can we just unpack that? Sure. Um, so I think uh, one set of ways to think about that is to look at, within America, places that followed a much more lockdown-focused strategy, closing schools, closing businesses, and so on, uh, like California, where I, where I live, uh, compared against a, 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 a place like Florida, which had a much lighter touch. Um, you know, the, the, while, while schools closed early, for the most part, through most of the pandemic, schools were open in Florida. Businesses didn't close. Churches didn't close. Uh, the, 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 uh, the public health authority didn't attempt to create anxiety and, and fear in the population. And through the pandemic, the overall, uh, the, the COVID uh, death rate, age adjusted for the fact that, that, that Florida is older than California, is roughly the same in California and Florida. There's no evidence that that California did much better on COVID. And then if you look at the overall excess death rate, all-cause mortality rate, actually, Florida did slightly better than than California. Um, You also have the example of Sweden, which followed famously a much lighter touch approach um, that that, that had had, uh, all-cause excess death rates through the pandemic that's on par with Australia, which had very little COVID in the early early days of the pandemic. Um, um, so, so Australia, Australia is, 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 it's important to understand exactly what happened in Australia and how its early success with managing COVID actually led to, I think, much worse outcomes than you otherwise would have had. Um, because Australia is located in the Southern Hemisphere, COVID did, uh, and it was a summer, the Southern Hemisphere summer when COVID hit, it wasn't widely seeded within Australia. And so the initial lockdowns worked. The initial lockdowns actually did reduce its cases to zero in, within Australia, but it set a policy trap that made it impossible for Australia to open up. Whenever a few cases would happen, yeah. entire regions would lock down, entire states would lock down, entire you know, large cities would lock down. Melbourne, in some you know, with brutal lockdowns, violating civil liberties. Uh, uh, the uh, the pol- politics of success with zero COVID made it so that you had to keep having that success over and over again despite any cost you'd have to pay for it. And ultimately, when 2022 hit, COVID spread rapidly all through Australia. And now uh, there actually have been more COVID cases per capita in Australia than just in the last nine months in total compared to the United States all through the pandemic. I mean, let me just say- Is that that right? Yes, so Australia actually has had more COVID cases per capita. Now you've had lower death rates, uh, and this is probably the best argument for lockdown you can make is that because you, you waited, you, you delayed the onset of all these inevitable COVID cases till after the vaccine. Yeah. But the problem is the vaccine was available in late 2020. Why did Australia wait until late uh, early 2022 to really open? You've basically had a full year of lockdown harms that could have and should have been avoided uh, during which uh, children didn't go to school, ma- mass violation of civil liberties uh, on a scale which is un- was unimaginable before, I think, un- in, in liberal democracies, uh, small businesses crushed, people with uh, skipping cancer treatment and uh, needed medical care, preventative care, uh, anxiety and depression at, in, at catastrophic levels that are going to be, that Australia is going to be paying a cost for for a very long time. So I, I would agree with much of what Jay has said. As you may know, John, I've, I've just recently released a book with the help of Sanjeev Sablok, who was an ex-Victorian Treasury economist before he left there, um, after having tried to call out the madness and been uh, not exactly welcomed to do so by the Treasury. Um, and it's by Connor Court Press, publishing uh, this year, actually just a couple of days ago, came off the press called Do Lockdowns and Border Closures Serve the Greater Good? Because, of course, it was the greater good that we were told was being served by these measures. And, and I will agree with Jay that we were lucky to be in the southern uh, uh, summer when COVID first hit. It also seems to be that in this area of the world, there was a bit more deep immunity to coronaviruses that are like COVID. And so it just wasn't particularly as lethal here as it was in other places of the world. 
Um, and so I think that the, certainly the border closures did keep out some of the COVID that would have otherwise been in here. Whether you could make an argument that the lockdowns domestically on top of the border closures were really adding much uh, is quite debatable. And indeed, what they were mainly adding, as Jay has just said, are those immense amounts of costs, uh, which we document in our book. Now, on the point of whether or not it was it could be argued that keeping the country closed until a vaccine arrived was maybe a good thing from a welfare standpoint, I mean, this again implies that the vaccine was the only thing you could do about COVID. In fact, we knew even in 2020 that there were some promising off-label, already existing treatments, including just what we normally do to support people's immune systems, you know, vitamin C, vitamin D, zinc, you know, not, not too hard to figure out these things, that if we had pushed out particularly to our vulnerable populations early on, this COVID threat would have been reduced to just a tiny little blip and we could have spun a different political story. And of course, as we had emerging evidence about many other kinds of early treatments, we could have put those into the mix. And I was arguing strenuously and hoping that the phone would ring from a politician that we need a new political story, even from the end of 2020 when it became, it had become clear that this was not going to be a passing fear. This was going to have a, have a, have a crowd dynamic to it, which would perpetuate the madness for quite a long time. And as you know, it's only now finally starting to, to really fade in some places. And here in Australia, we still see people around, you know, walking very scared to take off their masks and wanting their fourth or even fifth shot. So I think that the narrative that the vaccine was the thing we had to hold out for, that was something spun by our politicians. It was not actually something real in terms of a, a public health uh, reality. Let, let, let me agree with Gigi on that, on, on that actually. I, I do completely agree that there were many things that could have been done even in 2020 if, uh, if, if rather than staying closed, Australia had opened uh, to protect older people. Uh, you know, if you look at, for instance, what Sweden did fairly early on, they, they, they made big mistakes in Stockholm, in their nursing homes, leading a lot of death. But then they, then they changed course, apologized for this, and then adopted policies that protected their older population even when COVID was spreading through the rest of the population. They kept schools open, but they also provided tools and resources and knowledge uh, for their older population to, protect, to be protected during those, those big surges of COVID. And as a result, they've had better all-cause mortality outcomes than most of Europe and even and very close to what Australia experienced.